So welcome everyone to our long oral sessions on uh, detection and diagnosis. So I'm uh, Carol Sud from uh, University College London, and uh, with me is um, Ivana. Yeah, my name is Ivana Ishkum. I'm from University Medical Center in Amsterdam. Uh, so first, I think we have the introduction of our uh, different uh, speakers who will uh, have uh, three minutes each to uh, present themselves and uh, speak about uh, about their work. And uh, the first one, if is there, is uh, David Wood normally. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Are you going to should I share my screen or is, is uh, you can share your screen if you like? Yes. How's that? Is that working? Slowly loading up. Sorry. Yeah, that's working now. Okay, excellent. Hi, my name is David, uh, David Wood. I'm a researcher at King's College London. And uh, earlier today, on behalf of my co authors, I presented our work, which was titled Automated Triaging of Head MRI Examinations Using Convolutional Neural Networks. So, the background to our study is the growing demand for head MRI exams, which, uh, along with a global shortage of radiologists, has led to an increase in the time to report head scans around the world. Uh, in the UK, for example, reporting times have increased year on year since 2012, and it's actually estimated that at any moment, more than 300,000 patients are waiting 30 days or longer for their reports. And so for serious neurological conditions, so acute strokes and tumors and so on, this delay can really lead to really much poorer patient outcomes, increased mortality and higher healthcare costs. And of course, a promising solution uh, to reduce reporting times for abnormal scans uh, is to develop an AI assisted triage tool uh, to identify abnormalities at the time of imaging and then prioritize the reporting of these scans. However, a bottleneck to model development, of course, is the difficulty of obtaining sufficiently large clinically representative labeled data sets for computer vision training. Um, recently, however, it's become possible to automate data set labeling by deriving accurate labels from the radiology text reports using text classification models and then assign these labels to the corresponding images at scale. And uh, in this way, we are actually able to generate a large label data set of more than 50,000 axial T2 weighted scans from two large UK hospitals for computer vision training. Now, once trained, our models accurately classified T2 scans as either radiologically normal or abnormal with an AUC of 0.94. And uh, using uh, interpretability methods, we're able to generate visualizations of salient image regions both across and within slices, so this could enable sort of real-time review by radio uh, by radiologists, if you like. Um, and finally, we've put our model into clinical context through a retrospective simulation study, and we've shown that um, if our model had been used to suggest the order in which scans were reported at the two hospitals, then the time to report abnormal scans would have been reduced from 28 to 14 days, and from nine to five days at the two hospitals, uh, respectively. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, we'll go to the introduction of uh, uh, Antoine Olivier for the second paper. Uh, okay. Hi. Can you um, can you hear me? Hey, Antoine. We Hi. can hear you. Can you? Yes. Can Can you hear me? Okay. So let me let me share my screen very quick. Can Can you Can you see it? Not yet. It's coming. Yes, now we see it. Okay, so you can see the presentation. Yes. Okay. So um so yeah, maybe first a very warm thank you to the to the middle committee for uh, organizing this event and letting us present uh, this work. So this work is uh, in collaboration with Caroline Renault, and my name is Antoine, and I'm with Philips Research in Paris. So uh, the, the 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 paper deals with uh, imbalance in the data set in object detection problems, and uh, we apply a method to a fetal anatomy detection problem for which you can see the imbalance in the data set. But actually, we, we, we wrote this paper with the intent to be uh, very generic and so that it could be so that the method could be applied to any object detection problem. So on the on the on the right here, you can see uh, the 
initial imbalance in the training data set that we have. And the, the, the problem is that if then you train a network with this imbalance, then you will get something that performs very well on the overrepresented structure, but will perform quite poorly on the underrepresented structures. So what we want to do in a nutshell is just make the data set more balanced in order to uh, get a better performance in the end. So the general idea is that if there is n images in the data set, I want to find a probability vector such that if I sample my data set with this probability distribution, then I get that each class is equally frequent. Or as it may not always be possible to find such a vector p, uh, that each class is as frequent as possible. And so as it's not always possible to find such a vector p, then we use some classical optimization tricks to write this as, a, as, an, optimi as an optimization problem which is a convex optimization problem and then can be solved very, very efficiently in practice and is, is quite easy to, to, to solve. Then we apply the, the technique to, uh, to our problem. We see the effect on the image generator and we observe that it makes indeed the, 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 the class is much more balanced. And we also analyze the, the, the resulting results on the, on, the, on the final task and we get an overall performance uh, improvement. So we get a network that gets better at uh, detecting underrepresenting structure and therefore that is overall uh, better. Um, yeah. So so I would be very happy to answer uh, some questions if you have. Thanks. Thank you, Antoine. Um, and so just to say to all the participants and attendees to this session that they are obviously very welcome to put their question in the chat so that we can cover them afterwards after the presentation of the of our last presenter, uh, Walter. Hi, uh, thank you very much, Carol, thank you very much, hi, hi, Ivan, for chairing this session. Um, let me just share a screen, just one second, sorry. Perfect, can, can you see my screen? Yes, we see your screen. Perfect, uh, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Walter Hugo Lopes Pinaya. I am postdoc at King's College London, and it's a great pleasure for me to give you all a short introduction about our study on unsupervised brain anomaly detection and segmentation with transformers. So in these last years, transformers have revolutionized natural language processing. And in our study, we try to use them to model brain image data. So we use transformers to create a generative model that uh, learns the probability density estimate of a normal brain data sets. And then we use these training models to identify pathological features as deviation from normality. But since uh, traditional uh, transformers consume quite a lot of memory and we want to apply them to high resolution images, in our study, we use a efficient kind of transformer called PERFORM. And also we are using the vector quantized variation of the encoder to try to comprise the input image. And with these models, we also use two different mechanisms that we propose in our paper. The first one where we use the spatial information from the Latin space. And in the second one, where we train an uh, ensemble of transformers, where each one of the models reads the input data in a different order. So to validate our method, we apply that uh, in a series of experiments. And the first one, we use uh, anomaly segmentation on synthetic data. And as you can see here in the highlight image, our model, our method is identify fewer uh, false positives compared with the variation of the encoded based, uh, based approach. And this translates in a better performance. For example, here in the uh, maximum uh, dice score, we obtain a 0.5 from variation of encoders, and with our method, it grows to almost 0.9. In the second experiment, we use our method to perform the image-wise anomaly detection on syntax data. And here, as you can see in the graph, our, me uh, our method, it was able to assign the likelihood correctly for different classes of images. For example, in images that has classes that wasn't present during the training set, it has a low log likelihood. Compared with the images where we added uh, synthetic lesions it, that present an intermediary likelihood. 
and compare it also with images that are in distribution that have a, a higher log likelihood compared with the others too. And finally, we also access our method on anomaly, seg anomaly segmentation on real neural image data. And we evaluate four different data sets, each one with different uh, lesions. And from the quantitative results here, we also can observe that our method have a significant improvement compared with the variation of coders uh, based methods. And thank you very much for your attention. And please check out our posters at E3. Thank you for the presentation and thank uh, all presenters. Uh, the floor is now open for question. Uh, for questions, please uh, uh, post your questions in chat and we will read them or let, uh, let us know that we can turn on your sound. Um, there have been several questions already posted in the chat and some came from the study groups. Uh, so I will start uh, with those. Uh, there is first from April Academy uh, for Antoine. Thank you for your presentation. It was great. Uh, what is the benefit of your probabilistic approach compared to minority or balanced sampling? Um, okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, yeah, so I didn't have really the time to talk about it in, the, in this short introduction, but the thing is that in, in the problem we are tackling, uh, the presence of the various classes are not independent. So, for instance, if you have a, an example of the minority class, uh, for instance, a, a cerebellum or a heart in our case, then it means that you will also have the presence of uh, a majority class that is the head or the abdomen. So, if you, if you, for instance, if you implement a minority sampling, uh, you will also duplicate examples of the of the majority class and then you will introduce a new a new imbalance in the data set or a new bias in the data sets so this is something that we try to compare as baseline but then we realized that it indeed introduced a new bias and so it was uh, not performing as well as our strategy okay thank you uh there is another question for the first presentation so for david um from Hans Meine, uh, the question says, given that the data set is unique and not easy to get, is any of the modes report uh, NLPs or binary image classifier public, or do you plan to publish it? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the NLP models are available, actually. Um, I should have provided a link there. That's in, that's in both of the papers, um, in particular the European radiology one that I linked um, throughout the talk. And so the, the pre-trained models uh, are available and they, they generalize really well between different hospitals and things like that. So yeah, we really do encourage people to, to use them. Um, also, we have made various other parts of our pipeline available, like uh, dedicated labeling apps and, and all sorts of things like that. At the moment, the computer vision model isn't currently available. I mean, it's not entirely finalized either, but we, of course, we plan to, to, to make that publicly available as well. Okay, hey, uh, there is another question for Antoine uh, from Hans Meine. Uh, did you challenge or verify assumptions that equal frequencies give the best model? After all, the prior, uh, the prior probability will also be different at application time. Um, yes, so, okay, thank you also for these questions. So, uh, we did not check for the, for the prior at, uh, at, uh, at the test time. Uh, what we just check is that empirically we get the, the best uh, performance in terms of mean average precision. But uh, yes, we, we didn't see the effect of the of the like the, the, the fact that we changed the prior distribution at uh, at the inference time. Okay, there which which yeah. which is something that yeah we we, we thought about it uh, and then it was not that obvious to us how to implement it because of the choice of the architecture that we made with the YOLO architecture, where it's, yeah, we, we didn't really see where to, to, to like change for the priors in the, in, in the last uh, activation of the network. Uh, there are many questions for you. Uh, maybe the questions for the last presentation are also welcome. Uh, so the, um, um, the next question is, would your method be easily applied to segmentation, uh, to segmentation problems? And this question from Felix. Ilka. Yeah, so, so 
I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it could be directly applied to segmentation problems. So here we really uh, have a, like a balanced strategy at, at image level so that we've got the class equally representing within a batch. Uh, then for segmentation, maybe imbalance is at pixel level and then it, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how, how it could uh, extend to, to, such a, to, such a, to such a problem. Yeah, maybe just balancing the samples, voxel labels, or for segmentation problems. The same way that you do now, or would that be not possible? Um, okay, we can discuss later. Yeah, we can um, discuss. I have a question uh, for Walter. Um, so you learned uh, from a uh, large data set, uh, but from uh, non-patients. My question is, how much is your method impacted by motion artifacts, uh, the severe pathology, uh, everything that we see in very um, uh, diseased patients and that isn't normally present in the screening or normal population? Okay, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the idea of our method is try to uh, model this uh, data that doesn't have a disease. So we can be applied for uh, to to be applying for any kind of anomaly detection. So, for example, to try also to uh, uh, identify artifacts. Um, as I identify them as an outlier from the probability that the model is assigned to them. So, um, mostly we try to keep our input data as clean as possible, and we have been trying to. Uh, include methods to try to explore when we include also these kind of lesions and these kind of artifacts that we, for example, train that uh, our method to know that they should have a lower likelihood. But this would be more in a semi-supervised fashion way to train. But for, for now, we are focused mostly on unsupervised methods. Okay, thank you. Um... There is another question from uh, Bram de Wilde, also for you, uh, David. It seems the mask and augmentation extension improve performance from, from, from vanilla transformer a lot. Can you also apply this technique to, uh, with, for example, a variational autoencoder? Um, so we can apply the augmentation for the variational encoders. Uh, um, Regarding to the regarding to the masks, uh, it it the it's depends. It, it probably could somehow extract the likelihood from the uh, from the Latin code also the, with the variation of the coder and somehow also extract the spatial information from the Latin space. Because one limitation that we have on the variation of the code that is it just relies on the intensity of the the of the images, for example. When we reconstruction, when you perform the reconstruction, the intensity helps a lot when you have a lesions with high intensity, for example. Because you are performing the difference between the reconstruction and the input data. When we apply these masks, it helps also uh, based on what the the probabilistic models what, what the latin space was learning and to try to filter out the low capacity of the encoder or the coder to, to to create the reconstructions so I, I think it might be possible to apply to to variation encoders but we didn't we didn't try in this experiment we use transformers because it has a more flexible way to model this latin space compared with the variation encoder Thank you. Um, I'm trying to see which uh, chat, uh, which questions I have read in the chat. Uh, question from Robin Camarasa for Antoine. I think I haven't posed that yet. In segmentation, imbalance is a problem. Uh, do you think uh, your your method could be adopted for patch segmentation? Uh, to, to page selection in segmentation training, we have had that. Uh, yes, yeah, so so we've had a, a question relate, related to segmentation, yeah. but not exactly in this fashion. Okay. Yeah. So so yeah, so so maybe if if the 
if there is a patch selection within a larger image, then it, then it can, it can the, the, I mean, maybe the, the statistics of the presence of the different classes within each pass can be analyzed, and then it, the same kind of, of, of idea could be applied, I think, in, in this situation. Because then you, you could have uh, imbalance between the different patches with while having uh, diff uh, various uh, classes present within each, each, part, each patch. Um, so in, in, in this case, yes, maybe, maybe it could work. Um, Thank you. I, I think, in, in, in general, the, the method uh, is of interest if there is not only one class present in each patch or in each image in the case of object detection, because in this situation, you can apply very, very simple uh, balancing techniques. If there is um, several classes uh, present with uh, dependencies between them, then it, it, I, I think our method apply. OK, thank you. Um, there is a question uh, for Walter from uh, April Kademi. For the CT data, you added synthetic pathology. Can you comment on the differences between the results on real and the simulated data? Sure. So in the case of the simulated data, it's much more a uh, simple approach because we just have a single uh, lesion on the a single synthetic lesion in the image, and also the lesions are in a uh, reasonable size. But when we verify, for example, in the real data, uh, data sets, the lesions can be have a much more diverse formats and size, and it can have more than a single image uh, for more than a single lesion present. So that's why we believe that we have a, a decrease in the performance compared with the synthetic data, because it's much more complex with scenario. Okay, thank you. I see Carola has a question, so maybe Carola, you can... Uh, yeah, I will ask my question uh, directly to David. Um, so uh, you, the motivation for your for your work was to try to get uh, the abnormal scans to be referred or to be reported first. I was wondering if actually um, you could refine that slightly and say maybe I will uh, focus on all the reports that have either cancer or either um, a pathology that requires a treatment very rapidly compared to other abnormal scan for which actually treatment can be a bit delayed. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really, really good question. question. Um, sorry, sorry, I'm not sure if everyone else is hearing that. But um, uh, we have so so the 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 def firstly, uh, yes, we at the moment we don't uh, distinguish between like we we don't prioritize on the basis of like criticality or urgency or anything like that. We have we have a a, a category which is called radiologically abnormal and everything else you know and so those get put to the front of the queue and, and everything else goes goes back a bit but um but you're absolutely right and as we said in the paper as part of further work we're actually developing a third we're, we've got more granular categories as well put it that way but they're not part of the current paper we've got mass acute stroke vascular abnormality all these things but um what what so one thing is that we want to of course we want like in in a, in a sort of a triage setting in an inpatient setting you might have um you know you might have um much more critical things like strokes and those sorts of things that you want to put even you know stroke should obviously go before atrophy or alzheimer's or something like that but the truck in the in the U uk at least um it's legislated that all inpatient scans all emergency scans should be reported within one day anyway so that was sort of the motivation for not pursuing that because the, the the impact would have been uh, like quite minimal but um but yeah, but yeah, you're right, and so that's that's part of further work for sure. But but actually, um, I should say that the the, the definitions were um, you know um, created by a team of consultant neuroradiologists, and they so they it's sort of partially been taken into account. So abnormal is not just so it's, it's a minor small vessel disease and, and things you wouldn't care about or atrophy commensurate for age. That's considered radiologically normal. Um, and abnormal is defined to be things that would actually generate a, a, a downstream intervention. So there's already some, um, you know, like a, some granularity there. But 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 yeah, you're right. So that's that's something that we're definitely looking at um, prioritizing on the on the basis of urgency. Thanks very much. Um, this morning or today, earlier in the um, study session. Um, there was a question um, uh, also for David. 
about the recreation approach. So you say in the in the discussion that in the future you want to look at the uh, regression approach. The question is, is it possible to do it with the technology that is available for the extraction of uh, data of the yeah, reports, uh, text reports? That's additional work has, has to be done there to make it possible. Yeah, so the main one, it's another good question, the main one that we would care about is sort of atrophy because that's quite the trouble is you know <laughs> and you know i should say that walter and i know each other and we're sort of planning to combine forces possibly in the future but sort of a limitation of ours of our approach of sort of binary classifications there are a number of diseases and, and whatever that aren't not really amenable to to, to sort of categorization so like atrophy is, is more of a continuum things like that and so that's that's a real strength of, of walter's approach in, in terms of like generating z scores and stuff like that rather than committing to normal or abnormal um but of course we've got our own strengths as well um but so something like the uh, yeah the question is like is it going to take is it does it need more labeling or whatever so so in the case of um atrophy actually there's this thing called brain age so you can very easily um you know, generate a, a, a brain predicted age, and we, we have models for that um, as well. So that that's a very simple regression task because the the, the, the target um, is just we know the target, we know the patient's age, and so we know we've got a healthy subset of patients. We can learn the mapping between brain and healthy age, and then we can look for deviations. You know, in in patients who have a older appearing brain. And so then they can be flagged in, in that way. So that's a that's a really simple way in which regression would just be we'll, we'll get that for free. Basically, there's just no la no labeling needed. Um, but yeah, of course, when it comes to something like small vessel disease, it's that would potentially require um, more granular labeling, I guess. Um, but actually, the, there's some really standardized like uh, nomenclature and, and, and stuff like that in, in the radiology reporting. So they've got this like Fazakas score. And so there's really only sort of three kind of categories that the radiologists uh, uh, care about. And so that should be quite easy to, yeah, it wouldn't be a continuous regression in the case of small vessel disease. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you uh, very, very much to all the uh, people who ask questions and to our three presenters. Um, we will uh, stop the session uh, there. And if you have obviously further question and so on, I guess the um, the presenters would be uh, very happy to uh, to chat further and answer further directly. But thank you very much for joining today for the session. Thank you. Well, also a big thank you to our chairs. And now it's time for a short break. And even at middle, sometimes you have to make hard decisions. After the break, you have to decide whether you want to join the session on image registration and synthesis or on reconstruction and clinical data. But that is about 10 minutes from now. So please be back for a short oral session at 1.45 Lübeck time.